Let me ask you a question this morning. Um, has the study of the book of Revelation um, been depressing to you at all? No. <laughs> um, if, <clears throat> if you weren't a Christian and you had had the wherewithal to come Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and, and listen to what the Bible says about the end times, the last days. And yet you refused to, uh, to open your heart and submit to God. Then you would probably be de depressed. But we on the other hand, uh, have concern about this world in, in which we are living. We have concern about those that are day after day making choices to continue to harden their hearts to God. Uh, and callous, uh, callousness begins to grow around their heart because... Uh, we haven't seen anything that's going to be like it's going to be in the tribulation period, much less the great tribulation period. I mean, let's, let's just kind of do a quick overview. We've seen the seven seal judgments. We've seen the seven trumpet judgments. Uh, we've seen half of the world's population killed. Uh, a third of the oceans ruined, a third of the fresh water ruined. We've seen God's wrath literally rip into the universe and just shake it. We've seen devastating earthquakes. We've seen demons come out of the pit. Uh, and were able to, to inflict pain on people, but yet they could not die. And they even got to the point that they were calling out to the rocks to fall on us, kill us, so we don't have to face the wrath of God and the wrath of Christ. We've seen 200 million more demons released from Euphrates. We've, we've seen God's wrath poured out. Uh, in chapter 16, we'll investigate the seven bold judgments. But uh, right now, we have just come through chapter 12 and, and uh, chapter 13. And, and uh, it's from a little different perspective. We saw Satan fighting with the woman who was with child. And we know that's Israel and, and Christ. And, and we saw Satan and his demons fighting Michael and his angels. And Michael and his angels win, and Satan and his demons are cast to the earth, sentenced to the earth. They're no longer able to go, at this point in time, they're no longer able to go back into the heavens and have access to God for anything. They're localized on the earth. And that's where they'll remain until they're finally sentenced, the final day of judgment, and wind up in the lake of fire and brimstone. Then chapter 13, we saw the first beast, the Antichrist, came up out of the sea, um, the, the, the sea of humanity, so to speak. And, and then we saw the false prophet come up, and that's uh, out of the earth. We saw the mark of the beast, 666, which has been put on the forehead and on the back, or on the back of the hand of all those who believe in the Antichrist and believe in the false prophet, who, who are, are serving the purpose of Satan and not believing in Christ. And those who refuse to get the mark of the beast will be sought after by the Antichrist and, and uh, killed. So when, whenever, when, if you were not a Christian and you read through just even chapters 12 and 13, with, with, with any understanding whatsoever, you would, you'd be depressed. You'd, you'd be like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I don't care for that. But as 
has been the case so many times whenever things seem to be so depressing, God comes along and shows us a glimmer of hope. And such is the case with chapter 14. Chapter 14, we're going to see God's grace, God's lamb. We're going to see true religion. We're going to see worship, like just unreal worship. God's mark. We're going to see the, the 144,000 Jewish missionaries who have been sealed for protection so they can preach all over the world. And um, chapter 14 is the beginning of uh, a series of seven visions. You know, and periodically, as we have already seen, uh, the Holy Spirit in dictating the book of Revelation to John backs up a little bit and kind of takes a different perspective and shows you um, the, the, the same kind of judgment uh, window, if you will, from a different perspective. So you can get the full panoramic view of what's going to happen. Um, so let's look at the, the first of the seven visions, the 144,000 missionaries. Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Let me say this real quick. Um, I told y'all about the time that, we, that, that Diane and I were driving to church. And I said, sweetheart, I got a lot of scripture today. And she, she looked at me and grabbed my hand and she said, well, you, you don't need to use so much scripture. Just Why don't you just on the scripture? And I was like, no, no, no babe, I got to do the scripture. Of course, she was kidding with me, you know, because she didn't want me to be long-winded is what it was. Right? I got a lot of Scripture today. And I came this close for this particular sermon to cover verse 1. <laughs> and then I decided, no, I'm going to do the first five verses and, and we'll see if we can get it all in. If not, then I'll just pick up where I left off. We'll go again next week. So, Revelation 14, 1 through 5. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of a harpist playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the living creature, four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. So my first point is this, the person of the vision. Verse 1. And, and, and it's going to seem like that I'm going to hang on verse 1 for a little bit, but we'll, I promise you we'll get, we'll get past it. Verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So let's just look a little bit about what the Bible says about this lamb. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6 talks about the slain lamb. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And then we see the worshipped lamb, and this is Revelation chapter 5 verse 8, and then 12 and 13. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, 
To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever, the worshipped Lamb. Next in chapter 6, we see the worthy Lamb, chapter 6, verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. We go to chapter 7, we see the glorified and magnified Lamb. The glorified and magnified Lamb. Chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, for every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then finally in verse, uh, uh, chapter 14, verse 1 again, the vindicated Lamb, the vindicated Lamb. Then I looked. And behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So the person of this first section of chapter 14 is the Lamb. Is the Lamb. And remember, Revelation is the revealing of Christ. Point number two is this, the place of the vision. This again is still in verse 1. The place of the first vision is Mount Zion. Mount Zion. Now, I don't know if you've really paid a whole lot of attention to the use of Mount Zion. It's used in a couple of different ways. It's, uh, it's used or referenced as a heavenly place, and it's also referenced as a, as a historical place on earth. Psalm chapter 2, verses 2 through 6 tell us, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So this particular psalm, Psalm 2, is a messianic psalm. And, and it places the center of control during the millennial reign in Zion. Then we have Psalm chapter 48, verses 1 through 3, and then I'll pick up with 8 and read 11 also. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, His holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great King. Within her citadels, God has made Himself known as a fortress. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God will establish forever. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Psalm 132, verse 13, and then verse 17. Say, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. And then finally, we go over to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 that say, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it, and many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. So we see that this is paramount to the millennial reign. This is, this is the place where the Lord will dwell, where he will rule and reign from. And it's on this earth. Mount Zion was the capital city of David, and and the place of his palace. And the same will be for the Lord, the Lamb. Point number three is the vision. 
The people of the vision. The people of the vision. Uh, again, still in verse 1. Uh, the 144,000, these are the same 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe taken uh, to, to be sealed and to be missionaries the world over. We saw that in chapter 7 and verse 4. These are, these, these, these are flaming Jewish evangelists. And, and, and they're on fire for God and they don't, they don't care who knows it. Because they've been sealed. Many people are going to be saved during the tribulation uh, because of these evangelists. But right now, if we, 144,000 would probably be three times the total number of missionaries in the world right now. So you, can you imagine this world being flooded with three times the missionaries that we currently have out in the field? All over the globe, preaching the word of God. In chapter 14, these evangelists are being rewarded for their work in their ministry in the places Mount Zion. 14 verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And we can, we can as believers, we can learn something from the characteristics of this, this mighty band of evangelists. Number four is the characteristics of the 144,000. Let's look first at point A. They are preserved. They are preserved through the tribulation. They have the name of the Father and the name of the Lamb on their foreheads. And, and, and if, you, um, if you were identified at all with God, then it was certain death. We saw that in chapter 13 for sure. And, and these folks aren't just walking around without the mark. They're walking around with their own mark. It's the mark that is protecting them, that has them sealed. And they're aggressive about what this mark is all about and who they belong to. Now, this is a picture here in, in chapter 14 that's taking place after the tribulation period. And, and this, this 144,000 are so sealed that all of them make it. They didn't lose one. It didn't say 139,999. It said 144,000 are there present with the Lamb. And, and let me share something with you. This reminds me of something that is very, very, very important. When you are God's person, operating in God's will, for his ministry, you are sealed until he gets through with you. You are sealed until he, he has a very special ministry for you. And we all have one. And you are sealed in that ministry until he gets through with you. Now that, that's not a license to go stand in the, in the traffic and jump out in front of a truck or something like that. But... When God seals you, you are sealed. And it also means, and, and understand this, it also means that what he starts, he will finish. He that began a good work in you will finish it. Let her be as this, they are peerless. They're peerless in their ministry. This means that there's no equal. There, there's, there's never been a, 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 a group of missionaries, a group of evangelists, a group of preachers, a group of teachers like these. As they go the world over, what they're doing was incomparable. There's nothing like them. Verse 3 in Revelation 14 says, And they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. They sang a song that nobody else knows but them. It's because they had a special task. God had equipped them specifically to go and do this special task, this special, specific ministry. And old that churches and church people 
particularly pastors and preachers and, and church leaders could understand that we all have a ministry. You know, and just because this church and this congregation doesn't look like some other larger church with a larger congregation does not mean that God is not working in this church. Because, folks, He is. He is working in this church. And each of us have our own ministry. And He is equipping us to move forward with our ministry and with the church's ministry. And just because we have a smaller number of congregants than some of the larger churches in Columbia does not mean that we're not successful. It means that God has brought us who He has brought us or whom He has brought us. And we do what we do as He leads us, as He guides us, as He gives us clarity of mind to go and do what He would have us to do. Let her see. They are pure in their ministry. They are pure. Verse 4. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb. Now, I think, you, I think we today need to interpret this particular scripture on both sides of the fence here. So, so some say, some... Theologians say that the 144,000 were never married. That, 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 that somehow or another, God pulled 12,000 from each tribe, 12,000 men from each tribe that were never married. Well, that's physical purity. Uh, I, I get that. But they're human. And you can't be human without some kind of Sin. It's the sin nature. So they have to be covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. They have to be sealed. I think this also means that they have been sealed in such a way that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, they have spiritual purity. Spiritual purity. They are able to preach without regard to of being infiltrated with sin so much that they can't stand and preach. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 4 says this, For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one, one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray for, from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you received a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with, the readily, with it readily enough. So in 2 Corinthians here, Paul is, is talking about, again, this, this spiritual purity uh, that, that they, uh, they're presented to Christ as a chaste virgin covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Here in Revelation 14, I believe it means the same thing, that these 144,000 will be pure from the, the pollutions of life and from evil during the tribulation period. They will be presented before God as chaste virgins, spiritually clean. They'll be sanctified, set apart, uh, from all the evils of life, free from spiritual uh, adultery. James chapter 4, verse 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And I have to say, whoa, 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 to all of these, these churches that are chasing after the world, trying to be uh, all that in a bag of chips and entertaining. And, you know, I saw a clip, it's been about two months ago, where uh, they strapped the pastor. Now, he was a big old boy, too. I mean, he wasn't a little guy. Strapped him to a, uh, like a, 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 one of those old-timey tall back chairs. 
and had him on a cable system and flew him to the stage. Next Sunday. Sunday. Yeah, I'll have to get Scott to help me rig that. Uh, He'll have to... You'll have to come help me do that. We might even have to uh, get a safety harness or something. I have to get Houston safety harness and wear, wear that. So you see, you know, that's the kind of witness that God craves. And, and that's the kind of, of people that we should strive to be. We should, we should look at these elements and try our very best to, to apply these to our own life. The last one, letter D, uh, is they are peculiar in their ministry. Uh, so you need to be peculiar in your ministry. And Titus chapter 2, verse 14 says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And that, uh, that word there is, is to say that, that um, they are uniquely God's people. You are uniquely God's people. Uniquely God's people. God has made you to be who you are so that He can use you in the ministry that he has for you. And verse 5, Revelation chapter 14, verse 5, And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. The Antichrist and the false prophet uh, go around and are trying to persuade people through deception. And the 144,000 are going around trying to tell people and persuade people with the truth as their father, and God would have it to be that way. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 13. Zephaniah 3, 13 says, Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So to do the task, God put before these evangelists, they would have to display these characteristics in order to do that. Point number five. This is my last point. I'm going to go back to verses two and three. This is the praise of the vision. The praise of the vision. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed. This is a choir of redeemed, gospel-believing, gospel-preaching Jewish evangelists. And they're praising God. And he sealed them through the whole tribulation period. And you can, I, I don't know if we can even imagine what they have seen. And what, and what they have been a part of. And yet, no one could learn that song except them. I'm sure they faced all kinds of horrible things. And yet, they continued to preach. And God continued to seal them. It was a song of victory. And God and who God is and His ability to keep them. And a song of praise for His protection over them. And a song of worship because God is a sovereign God. A, a sample, a sample of, of this kind of worship we, we saw back in Revelation chapter 7 verses 9 through 12. And, and, and honestly folks, I, I can't wait to be a part of this kind of worship. Verses 9 through 12, chapter 7 of Revelation. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. That no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne 
and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. And crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You know, you know sometimes our, our church services uh, are pretty filled with, with participation during our praise and worship time. And, and sometimes it's, 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 it's really good and sometimes it, it literally gives me Chills, because it is so good. Can you imagine what it would be like if everyone on Sunday morning praised God and truly worshipped Him with their whole heart and soul? Can you imagine what it would be like to hear 144,000 give God this kind of praise? In contrast... Uh, to, to the harps being mentioned, uh, especially in the Old Testament, whenever they would have harps, that would be, it would be associated with joy. Um, in, Psalm, in Psalm 137, though, it talks about 70 years of, uh, of, of time where the Jewish people, the Hebrews, actually hung their harps up because there was no joy. But this day, the harps come out. And the music and the, the praise crescendos to, to an awesome level. All of heaven is filled with music and praise and, and worship. Just think back in, in chapter 7 to that that. that choir that couldn't even be numbered just this massive sea of the church standing before the throne of God unashamed 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 of the lamb do you think that that uh, you're going to worry about the old lady standing behind you as you sing no you're not you're not. You know, are, are you so focused on what's going on around you in the world that, that whenever you come here on Sunday, you, you fail to engage God? Are you so worried about somebody sitting next to you and hearing you, thinking in their own mind, oh Lord God, that is a joyful noise. No, stop focusing on that. Stop focusing on things like that. Stop focusing on the world and what's going on around you. Stop focusing on what you have to do tomorrow when you get up and go to work. Stop it. And at home, when you have a moment to be with God, put all of it behind you. I promise you, if you will open your heart, to the Holy Spirit and worship God without the chains being bound around you with whatever is going on in your life that God's Spirit will meet you like you have never had before in your life. One of the most beautiful sights. I'll just share this with you. One of the most beautiful sights I have ever seen before in my life. I walked into the living room. I had been outside and I walked into the living room and Diane had been listening to some, some worship music and she had been reading her Bible and stuff. And whenever I walked in, she was sitting in her chair. And tears just flowing down her face. And all I could do was just 
stand there and worship with her. The movement of the Holy Spirit in that room was so real. So real. And I longed for it. I longed to be in His presence. I longed to worship with Him. And every morning I, I, I have now a, a, a routine whenever I get up. And, and one of the first things that I say is, God, remove anything in my life today that is going to keep me from communing with you because I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to be with you. I want to sense your presence in my life. And I want to see your great and mighty hand doing things. So the 144,000 with their ministry on earth turned into praise in heaven. Such a great example of what we should be doing. Imitating that praise. Imitating those characteristics, those character traits. So in, in, in closing, let me just ask you a couple of questions that I, that I wrote down this morning. Where are you today? And what I mean by that is twofold. Where are you in your practice of the Christian life? Where are you in, in asking God to commune with you? In asking God to use you? In asking God to, to uh, clarify and give you wisdom and knowledge and clarity of mind of what your ministry is so that you can be used of Him? Where are you? And secondly, where are you today in your praise and worship of the Lamb? It's, it's, not, it's not just somebody that we read about. It's not just somebody that we, that we say, well, you know, Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and now I'm covered by His blood, and He was, he was put in the grave, and in and, and, and God's timing, on, in God's schedule, He came out of the grave and, and was with them for... Uh, for a time and then ascended into heaven and now he's at the right hand of the Father and, and on and on and on and on. You know the story. It's not just that we read about him or talk about him or, 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 or preach about him. It is that we, we worship him. We love him. We expect his return. We expect to live in heaven with him throughout all eternity. That's where we are supposed to live. Every day, we're supposed to live in that place. So let's open our hearts to God and live the life worthy of the calling, the Bible tells us. Let's open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and give Jesus all the praise that He deserves. Not just here on Sunday morning, but every day of the week. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you today. I want you in a sense, to rededicate your life with regard to your worship. Simple thing. It's a simple thing. You've had now years and years and years and years worth of being in church and singing in church, and, and you know most of the classic hymns and most of the praise and worship songs. You know those. And, 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 and you get into a habit of, of singing, but I want you to rededicate your life with regard to worship. I want you to reevaluate the, the way that you go before God with your worship. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this, mis this message. We thank you, Lord God, that we see such an example um, to stir our hearts that we, that we may live in a way that is, is worthy of the calling of being one of your children. Father, ignite in us, in our hearts, a desire to walk with you and to talk with you. A desire um, to, to, to latch onto the hem of your garment, Jesus. Oh, Lord, help us today. And I pray in this hour that we would rededicate ourselves with regard to our worship. That we would worship you more fully in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.